I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the second chapter of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing psychological research, why it's important, approaches to research, analyzing findings, and ethics. So let's get started with why is research important? Well, through systematic scientific research, we're able to divest ourselves of preconceived notions and superstitions. Our goal is to gain an objective understanding of ourselves and our world. Now, scientific knowledge is empirical, which means that it's ground in objective, observable evidence. The problem for psychology, though, is that while behavior is observable, the mind is not. So, for example, you might see someone crying, and you don't know if they're crying because they're happy, if they're sad, or if they're in pain. You need that sort of insight into their mind. The use of research information. Well, what is the link between exposure to media violence and later aggression? This has been argued for over 60 years. So does television make kids violent or are kids who are prone to violence drawn to violent TV shows? Similarly, do programs such as D.A.R.E. actually have any effect on whether or not someone uses alcohol or other drugs? The data just don't support the D.A.R.E. program. When someone makes a claim, they have to, it has to be examined through research. And this is a difference between facts and opinions. Facts are observable realities, whereas opinions are personal and may or may not be accurate. As Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, what's the difference between induction and deduction? Deduction is top-down, whereas induction is bottom-up or data-driven. So deduction starts with a generalization that is tested against real-world observations. So that is Socrates in that picture. It's actually the death of Socrates. His last words famously being, I drink what? But he came up, or there's a syllogism about Socrates that all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. And that is an example of deductive reasoning because it starts with a generalization and it ends with something specific. Induction uses empirical observations to formulate theories, which generate hypotheses that are tested through deduction. So B.F. Skinner or Jean Piaget, their theories were developed through induction and then tested through deduction. A theory is a well-developed set of ideas that explain an obser observed phenomena. And so, for example, we can talk about psychoanalytic theory. Now, Freud has a theory that you can divide the mind into the id, the ego, and the superego. You can also have a hypothesis, which is a testable prediction, often word, worded as an if-then statement, and it bridges the gap between ideas and reality. So I could say due to gravity, I would hypothesize that if I drop my pen, it'll hit my desk. If you heard that, that is a confirmed hypothesis. It's tougher to make hypotheses about the id, the ego, and the superego. And a scientific hypothesis is falsifiable, which means that it's capable of being shown to be incorrect. That's a problem with Freudian theory. It's difficult to disprove it uh, or make it falsifiable. But if a theory is, or excuse me, if a hypothesis is falsifiable, that provides us with some confidence that the information is correct. A clinical or case study focuses on one person or a small group of people. Now, why would you do this? Well, when you focus on just a few individuals, you get an enormous amount of data and insight into those particular cases. However, there may be issues with generalizing from case studies to the general population, and this is what we would call an external validity issue. For example, Freud studied hysteria, which we would now label as conversion disorder. And that's when you have a limb that doesn't work, but the cause is psychological rather than physical. Now, Freud generalized from his hysteric patients to everybody else, and that is a generalizability issue, and as I said earlier, an uh, issue with external validity. 
When you observe a behavior in its natural context, that's naturalistic observation. A problem is that people might change their behavior if they know they're being observed. Now, Jane Goodall spent five decades observing chimpanzee behavior, and she was criticized, though, that for giving the chimps names that match their personality. So she named one Frodo, and he eventually became an alpha male and became aggressive with her. Probably not due to the name, though. Her favorite chimp was named David Greybeard, and he was friends with another chimp named Goliath. Today, chimps would be identified by numbers and letters. You wouldn't assign names based on their personality. Now, naturalistic observation has a high degree of ecological validity because it's better to observe chimps in their natural environment than in the zoo. But the downside is that there's a huge investment of time and money and also issues with observer bias, meaning that people may unconsciously alter their observations to fulfill their hypotheses. Surveys are lists of questions answered by research participants. A sample is a subset of the population that researchers are interested in studying. Larger samples are likely to be better because they begin to approximate the population of interest, which is again an external validity issue. So the more people you have, the more likely they are to match the characteristics in the population that you want to study. For example, you might talk to or ask 140 people about their prejudicial attitudes. Uh, and they, your book talks about a study that was done a decade after 9-11, and they found lingering prejudices about some groups of people. Archival research is something that I do quite a bit of. I study personal ads that people place in uh, online and used to be in newspapers. And I study things like the way older people are portrayed in the media. Now, this is when you use existing records to answer research questions. Researchers doing archival research never directly interact with research participants. So, for example, we've studied the portrayal of aging in birthday cards, and I can tell you that older people are apparently uh, the only group that you can still mock about issues that have to do with getting older. So, issues of memory, mobility, and sexual functioning. It's very inappropriate, but it's still done. A problem with archival research, actually two problems. One is that researchers have no control over how the data was collected, and there's no guarantee of consistency between data sets from one source to another. So in terms of the dating research that I do uh, on personal ads, some free sites may attract different kinds of people than paid uh, personal ad sites might. Longitudinal research is a design where uh, data gathering occurs repeatedly over time. So you might survey the same people about their dietary habits at 30, then at 40, then at 50, uh, but it's the same people. Cross-sectional research is when multiple segments of the population are compared at the same time. So a group of people in who are 20 are compared to a different group of people who are 30 and to a different group of people who are 40, uh, et cetera. Cross-sectional research is limited by differences between cohorts and because different people in different generations go through different social and cultural experiences. Longitudinal research is used or is best used in studying things like disease and risk factors because you can see how they develop over a lifetime. How if, however, issues with time, meaning that they take a lot of time, money, they cost a lot of money, attrition, people drop out of longitudinal studies all the time, and survivor bias, which is when you generalize from people who make it all the way through a longitudinal design, are all issues with uh, this research. Correlation means that there's a relationship between two or more variables and that it's not necessarily causal. A correlation coefficient, known as Pearson's R, is bounded by negative one, which means a perfect negative or inverse correlation, and plus one, which is a perfect positive or direct correlation. Zero means no correlation. So a positive 
correlation is a direct relationship and a negative correlation is an inverse relationship. And an example would be the relationship between height and weight, which is uh, in the figure to the right. That's a positive or direct relationship because in general, taller people weigh more. So I'm 6'2 and I weigh 180, which is probably more than someone who's 5'2. Correlation does not imply causation due to the possibility of a confounding variable. So, for example, there is a relationship, a positive correlation between ice cream and drowning. The more ice cream that's sold, the more people drown. Now, that's not because ice cream causes people to drown. It's because uh, both are related to summertime. More people are swimming, more people are eating ice cream. You might also find illusory correlations. Those occur when people believe relationships exist between variables. So some people think that there's a relationship between the moon phase and mood, and the DAP is the draw person test, um, which is also an illusory correlation. I always remember an illustrative Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown tells Linus that he drew his hands behind his back because he's insecure, and Linus says, no, it's because he can't draw hands. That's illusory correlation. So why does this occur? Well, one answer is confirmation bias. And this is when we believe something to be true, we seek supportive evidence and ignore non-supportive evidence. So for example, research shows that in automotive shopping, people do research after they buy a car to confirm that they made a good choice when obviously you should do the research before you go shopping. Most basic experimental designs have two groups, an experimental group and a control group, and they're treated the same except for the experimental manipulation. An operational definition is the precise meaning of a variable within an experiment. Now, operational definitions are necessary, but they're always insufficient. So if we were studying something like violent behavior, we might include hitting and kicking, but not abusive verbal behavior, which is certainly a violent act. But again, uh, that's why these are necessary, but always insufficient. Where do you draw the line at what is a violent act or violent behavior? Experimenter bias is when researchers' expectations may skew the results of the study. And so a way to deal with experimenter bias is through single or double blind studies. In a single blind study, participants don't know what group they're in. So they don't know if they're in the experimental group or the control group. In a double blind study, neither the participants nor the researchers know the group that the participants are in. The placebo effect is, shows that ex expectations can influence outcomes. So if you're given a pill and told that it'll make you drowsy, you might actually fall asleep. An independent variable is manipulated by the experimenter and a dependent variable is measured by the experimenter. So one of the reasons why it's called a dependent variable is because its value is thought to be dependent on whether you receive the independent variable or not. Participants are often college students, and this leads to what's called the volunteer problem, because college students tend to be younger, more educated, more broad-minded, uh, and less diverse than the general population. So again, this is an external validity issue. Ideally, we like to work from a random sample, and that's when every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected for being in the study but those really occur only in textbooks. Much more common is random assignment, and this is when all participants have an equal chance of being assigned to either group in an experiment. And that's really critical for sound experimental design. Once your data is collected, a statistical analysis is conducted to see if there are meaningful differences between your groups. Differences are significant if there's a 5% or less likelihood that that result is due to chance. And that's what's known as the alpha level. Experiments assert that significant differences are due to the impact of the independent variable. Now, the APA publishes a style manual for submitting your paper for peer review. And that's the book that I wrote on how to teach, uh, to teach students how to write in APA style. 
These peers anonymously judge the value of your research, and they're usually professionals and scholars who are actively involved in research themselves. One of the reasons why they're studying or uh, examining your research is due to the replication. So peer review makes sure that other scientists can replicate the research, which means that they can repeat it and get the same results, which is crucial to the scientific method. Reliability is all about consistency, but being consistent is not the same as being correct. So for example, as I said earlier, I weigh 180 pounds, but I may get on a scale that says I weigh 130 pounds. Then I might step off it again and step on it again, and it says I weigh 130, degree, 130 degrees, 130 pounds again. Now that scale is reliable because it's giving me the same weight over and over again, but it's not valid, at least in, unless I've lost several limbs and suddenly weigh 50 pounds less. Validity is all about truth. So the extent to which a given instrument accu accurately measures what it's supposed to measure is its validity. For a measure to be valid, it has to be reliable. But like I said before, uh, with weight, a reliable measure doesn't have to be valid. So a legitimate question to ask is, do the ACT and SAT correctly measure scholastic aptitude? Are they reliable and valid measures? Let's talk about ethics and research. So an IRB is an institutional review board, and that's a committee that reviews proposals for research involving human participants. Now, the inform you'll have to sign an informed consent form, and that tells you what participants can expect, including the risks and implications of the research. And you're also informed of your rights, such as the, the fact that your participation is completely voluntary and that you're free to withdraw from the study at any time. Deception involves purposely misleading participants. And so the picture is actually from the Milgram obedience experiment where participants were told that they were shocking people to death. Now they weren't really, they were being deceived. Debriefing happens at the conclusion of a study and it tells participants what the purpose of the experiment was, how the data was used, and if deception was used, why it was necessary. Let's talk about research with animals too. Researchers often use rats, mice, and birds as research subjects, and the APA estimates that 90% of animals that are used in research are in fact rats, mice, and birds. They're considered to be substitutes uh, for research that would be unethical if it was done to human participants. And you would have an IACUC, which is an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, and that's basically what an animal research IRB is. And they ensure the humane treatment of animal research subjects. Well, to finish up, I will remind you again that all your APA problems can be solved through Learn APA Style. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, you can consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Thanks for listening.